I'm going to read you this comment uh, that recent that I recently received on my channel. Um, you can always take the fringe misbehavior of any group as an excuse to accuse religion as being bad. Why don't you look at the good that is done in the name of God? Uh, hospitals, charities, food drives, etc., etc., etc. Seems like you have moral authority. You have the moral authority. And who says you're compassionate besides yourself? As I've stated in a previous video, my gripe with religion is not with the people, but with the religion in people. It's never what they think it is. All religions that I've encountered, no matter their stripe or intensity, only allow people, a person or a group of people the self-license to, to do good and or bad things for bad reasons. When I say this, I'm not just talking about the bad reasoning behind the ludicrous claims about the nature of reality that religions rely upon as their foundation for their authority in making moral claims. I'm also talking about the moral blindness that seems to set in whenever someone who is religious is confronted with the evil done in the name of their faith, or sometimes in the name of other faiths. To better understand part of what I'm talking about, you should know a little bit about something called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is discomfort caused by holding uh, conflicting cognitions simultaneously. Cognitions are things like ideas, beliefs, values, emotional reactions, so on and so forth. The theory of cognitive dissonance in social psychology poses that people have a motivational drive to reduce dissonance by altering existing cognitions or adding new ones to create a consistent belief system. Now, something else that you should understand and be fairly familiar with, whether you're religious or not, is that religions and holy texts say anything they tell their adherents to do, or anything recorded in their holy texts, that, has, that was done in the name of their faith, is good. By this, I mean religious figures usually ignore uh, patently evil things done in the name of their faith when addressing their flocks, whether it comes from a real-life example, or from one of their holy texts. And holy texts also emphasize the righteousness of faith and the good that comes from having faith, no matter what is being done in their holy books. There are two consequences of this simple fact. The first, and the easiest one to point out, is that because everything in a holy text is claimed to be good by that holy text, there is no way to distinguish what edicts and actions in those holy texts are in keeping with modern moral imperatives based only on that holy text. The second consequence is that it leads followers of a faith to believe that anything they do based on their faith is good and or that, at the very least, anything that someone does that is bad is obviously not based on their faith. When religious believers are faced with a patently evil thing done in the name of their religion, they experience cognitive dissonance. And in order to reduce this discomfort, they engage in apologetics. So they can continue thinking that their faith is good. They do things like pointing out only the good that religion does. They make arguments in an attempt to negate the patently evil things that their holy text points to as being good by pointing out other contradictory edicts in their holy text. They say that the people who commit acts of evil in the name of their faith aren't real followers of their faith and call them fringe. When religious people, eh, religious moderates, attempt to highlight the goodness of their faith, they are effectively creating an atmosphere in which the evil that is done in the name of religion is not only excusable because of the good that religion supposedly does, but it makes the evil done in the name of religion possible in the first place. Now, I realize this seems simplistic, but to drive this point home, I'd like you to consider, the ans consider an answer the following set of questions. This 
list could have been a lot longer. And you could see how much longer I could make it by going to my video, uh, the question. Would any organization that has been shown, proven, and admitted its dedication to the promotion and continued protection of child rapists even be allowed to exist, let alone have an observer seat at the United Nations were it not for hundreds of millions of people making apologies for the leaders of that organization who protected and colluded in the crime of child rape. Would any faction of a group that openly promoted ignorance be allowed to have influence over an educational system without hundreds of millions of people associated with that group calling that, fa calling that faction that makes up 40% of the American public minority and fringe? Would any cause that wanted to block funding for the most promising branch of medical research for the treatment of most debilitating, painful, and deadly diseases and conditions causing untold amounts of physical and emotional suffering because of concerns derived from a Bronze Age text be allowed to do so were it not for billions of people supporting the validity of that text. Would you consider a person who answered any of those questions with a yes a sociopath? Would you consider a person who refused to answer the first three questions a coward? If someone responded to the first three questions by pointing out the good that those organizations, factions, and causes do, would they sound, at best, like a sleazy car salesman? Last question. Why don't I emphasize the good that religion does? I suppose I'm slightly disappointed that uh, Anne Whittingham in particular should say, oh, I knew they'd bring up condoms and child rape and yeah. homosexuality. It's a bit like a burglar in court, so you would bring up that burglary and that manslaughter. You never mention the fact I give my father a birthday present. You know, it's, yes, yes, are you getting the message? There is a reason we hammer home these issues, because they matter.